What do you want? For crying out loud, what do you want? Um, I wondered how long I'd stand there before someone actually gave me an answer. It was a rhetorical question. I know. That's the name of the series. What do you want? And I love that question sometimes. And sometimes I hate that question. What do you want is great for me when I am certain of what I want, certain of something I like, and I know what tempts me. I know what really gets me excited. And someone says, I'm going to ask you to betray your family, walk away from your family, but for this amount of money, you, you know, I, there's no amount of money that you could give me to tempt me to walk away from my family and, you know, betray my family. But if someone wanted to tempt me with food, it is, you know, it's very obvious what it is for me. Do you know what it is for you? It's popcorn, movie theater popcorn for me. If I had a big tub of popcorn right here right now, there's not much you could do to take it away from me because I would fight you. Uh, chocolate, I also love chocolate. You know what those things are for you. Sometimes though, when I'm standing there very indecisive, I'm standing, you know, Ashley has asked me to go to the store to get something and she was not super specific or I'm trying to like surprise my family or something. I'm trying to decide like, oh, what's the best thing? Or I'm really trying to like do something kind for, for a family member and I'm standing there at the card aisle and I will read every single card before I decide because I don't know what I want. Like, I don't know. It's, it takes me forever. So that I, I can be very indecisive. I can also be certain. What do you want? It's just a loaded question. So that's a fun title for a series. What, what do you want? And we're going to get into what in the world that means. But I'll start by just telling you, I, I think you've already caught on this. Uh, ben, I believe, said it. We're talking about, oh yeah, the big T. I don't know what big T comes into your mind. Lots of different T's. Tennessee. I love Tennessee. I, I don't know what we're talking about temptation in this series and this is this is a big one this is an important one this is one that i mean we hint on we talk around temptation like uh you know every series we talk about we we have to acknowledge that there's a god way in it and a your way and so that's what we're going to focus on and how in the world do you face temptation wisely but with this with the series about temptation you know what are we really what we would really love, what I really wish is that God would just take it away sometimes in the moment of temptation. Do you ever feel like, God, I wish you would just take it away, like make this temptation go away, take it, take it away so I don't, I don't face that temptation anymore. And that's our solution. That's what we want to happen is it's just gone from us. That's not worked out for me so far in my life. I hope that, uh, well, I should say, I hope, I would imagine that's true for you, that we can't just make it disappear. So we know that much, obviously. It also is a worthwhile question to say, well, why did God give us a choice in the first place? Like, why are we, are we facing temptation? Like, don't we struggle with a decision on, should I do the right thing? Should I, uh, you know, what, what do I do here? Don't we face that because God made us and then he started it. And so if he had just not given us a choice, then we wouldn't have this problem. So this is the story of our world, the story of existence. This is nothing new under the sun, nothing new for us. So we have a lot we can learn. We're going to learn just a little bit tonight, and then we got a series, and then we're going to... Anyway, so we got just to get started on this is the story of our lives. As a matter of fact, it is the story of the Bible, and those of you who have been students of the Bible for a long time, this will not... Some of this will not surprise you, um, but but this struggle that we have, it's been people have been facing this since literally the very beginning. It's one of the reasons we have the the beautiful piece of artwork that we're in a series was that last year, uh, whatever we did the Origin series. That was two years ago, if I remember correctly. Anyway, the Origin series, the Garden of Eden. So we're gonna we're gonna watch a video on that in just a second, but. But Paul, the writer in the New Testament, he wrote something that it really resonates with me. It's in Romans chapter 7. It's not on your handout, but this might sound familiar to you. I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, in my sinful nature. I want to do what's right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. But if I do what I don't want to do, if I do what I don't want to do, 
I'm not really the one doing wrong. It is sin living in me that does it. I have discovered this principle of life, that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. Paul is saying, I don't care how super Christian you are. I don't care how strong of a Christian you are. As long as you are in this flesh, in this body, there is going to be temptation. There's going to be the pull to do what you don't want to do, to do wrong, to do wrong. Oh, it's just so aggravating. It's frustrating. So let's shine a light on that. Let's discover what we can about temptation and do what we can to know how do we face it. How do we face it wisely? So let's start by seeing what we can learn from the Bible. And we're going to cover the whole Bible tonight. We're going to do it Bible project style, which means a short animated video instead of me just drawing on the board, which, of course, I'm inspired by Bible project animation to draw on a whiteboard. And the whiteboard's all over the place. So we're going to watch uh, a video that explains the story of the Bible. And for those of you who, you know, like you read the Bible, you own a Bible, but you've never really paid attention to the whole Bible. This is really going to be helpful to you to put a little uh, confidence, give you some confidence in the truth of the Bible. And so let's watch this video now. The Bible is an important book, but it's really long. Yeah, it's a collection of many books written over a long period of time, but altogether they tell one unified story. So what's the story of the Bible? Well, it begins by introducing us to a beautiful mind, the author of all reality, a being called God. And he has the power to take the dark chaos of the uncreated world and bring about order and beauty and a garden full of life. And to crown this accomplishment, God appoints these creatures called humanity. Or in Hebrew, Adam. And they're made as God's image. Which means that they're commissioned to rule this beautiful world on God's behalf by harnessing all of its potential and creating even more beauty and order. This is a story about humans using their power to do meaningful, life-giving work. But the question is, how? Yeah, humanity now faces a choice that's represented by a fruit tree. So humans could partner with God and find freedom by trusting in his knowledge of good and evil. Or they could seize power and define good and evil on their own, which, God warns, will kill them. And they hear the voice of a dark, mysterious creature that tells them the choice is simple. Take the fruit. It'll give you power and freedom to rule the world on your own terms. And so they seize this knowledge. And as a result, they become suspicious and self-protective. It leads to fractured relationships, violent power grabs, and ultimately a whole civilization, Babylon, that has redefined evil as good. And so God scatters this corrupted human project. And here the story of the Bible takes an important turn. We zoom in to the story of a man and a woman who come out of Babylon, Abraham and Sarah. Yeah, God promises that from them will come a new people, a nation that has another chance to make the right choice. And if they succeed, it will open up this new way forward for the rest of humanity. And this is why the rest of the Bible story is about this family. And it does not go well. Despite God's personal guidance, Abraham's family gives in to that same temptation to redefine good and evil on their own terms, apart from God. Even when their best people were in charge, rulers who loved God's guidance and had divine wisdom, even they gave in. And so Israel was warned by their own prophets that these choices would lead them back to Babylon, this time as conquered captives living in exile. And that's exactly what happened. So even with God's personal guidance, Israel fails. Who can succeed? Well, the prophet said that the story wasn't over. God's going to send a new leader to Israel to cover for their failures and to transform the people's hearts and minds so that they can make the right choice. And so the part of the Bible called the Old Testament ends and these promises are left hanging. And then the biblical story continues into the New Testament. We're introduced to a man who comes from the line of Israel's kings, Jesus of Nazareth. And he said that he was bringing all these promises to their completion. He confronted that dark, mysterious evil that all humanity has given into and resisted its power. And then he announced that God had arrived to rule the world through himself. Jesus taught about God's definition of good and evil, and he said that real power is serving others. According to Jesus, it's people who love the poor and even love their enemies. These are the kinds of people who actually rule the world. And that's confusing, but also really beautiful. 
And so is the claim that the story goes on to make about Jesus, that he is God become human, to be for Israel and for all humanity what we could never be for ourselves. He came to take the consequences of our evil into himself, and his sacrificial love proved more powerful than evil than even death itself. So now humanity's presented with a new choice. Represented by a new tree. Stick with the old way of being human or venture into this new way. And in the story, those who choose the way of Jesus find themselves energized by God's own power. People who know that they are loved and forgiven by God can become people who love and forgive others in return. The Jesus movement quickly spread throughout the world, forming these new communities of people who follow the way of Jesus. But they faced problems. There was persecution from the outside by people in power, and inside there was confusion, even compromise. Yeah, because following Jesus is really hard. And so the movement's leaders called apostles. They wrote letters to comfort and to challenge these communities to stay faithful to the difficult way of Jesus. And they're called to hope for the day when Jesus will come and change everything. And so the Bible ends by pointing to the future day when all wrongs are made right, when evil is eradicated, heaven and earth are united, and humanity can rule the world together in the love and power of God. Man, I love those guys. Make it so clear and so helpful. So this is not new. You, you remember the garden. You know what happens. So when we experience temptations, it's like what Adam and Eve experienced. There is a choice. There is a moment of decision, much like we face multiple times every day, represented in the Garden of Eden by, what was it? By a tree, but not just any tree, because lots of the trees were good for them to eat. But what was that one called? The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So he gave them a, gave them a choice. There's a tree, don't know what was hanging on the tree, but it was something that was delightful, looked good to their eyes. And so as they came to this choice on this, on this road, they got to choose which way would they go? What mattered more to them? What did they want? What did they want more? And that choice is still true for us today. Will we choose God's way, which leads to awesomeness, purpose, our full purpose in life, to, to partner with him, to spread his goodness through the earth, to, um, to know our true identity, to have confidence and, and not be insecure, to really be you know, protected and cared for and provided for and to be one with God and have shalom and unity and peace. That's God's way. But there's obviously another something out there that looks desirable enough, that looks interesting enough for Adam and Eve to wonder, well, hey, what, what's down that way? So what is the other way? Well, I, I'm being overly simplistic, but I would just say it's, it's my way. Are you willing to choose God's way and let him define what is good and bad? Or do you face temptation? Do you face choices? Of course we do. When we face choices, we realize, I don't know that I want that way because this way is more interesting. It looks more fun, to be honest with you. It looks like I can, in this moment, get what I want out of it. I can feel good. I can, you know, enjoy what I have. As a matter of fact, John, one of Jesus' closest followers, said it this way, and, and it's on your handout if you want to uh, read along what John said in, in a letter. John chapter 2, he, he is telling us that this is what temptation looks like. This is what this decision looks like uh, the, to be pulled away from God. Verse 15, do not love this world, nor the things it offers you. For when you love the world, you do not love the Father in you. You're either being pulled by the world, the system that says, no, this is good, do it, do it this way, or the Father, you're trusting the Father. For the world, this path, offers only a craving for physical pleasure, or some translations say lust of the flesh. Maybe I should have gone with that one, but a craving, I, I want this, it, it sounds good to me, I like that, it looks good to my eyes. And the next one is a craving for everything we see, it looks good to my eyes, I'm interested in that, so if I see it, I want it, I want to take it all in and I want what I see. And a pride in our achievements and possessions. 
These things are not from the Father. You cannot find those things necessarily in, in the way you want them. You will not necessarily find them on this path. If you, if you desire to have them, pray to have them in your way, you define how it's going to be. I say this is good. I want this. And so I'm going to have it my way. They're not from the Father, but they're from the world. And this world is fading away. Along with everything that people crave. Well, all those things that we want. Everything that you want, doesn't it eventually fade away? I mean, like, you kind of get over it. The moment passes and you're kind of like, well, was that worth it? And that's really a fair question. When we fall to temptation and don't resist and we go this way, afterwards, don't you have a little bit of that? I don't know if that was worth it. If I got back to that choice again, I, I might do that differently. That is very often the case. You feel guilt, shame. You don't want to tell people about it. You're like, oh, are, are we going to ask in small groups all the things that we're guilty of that we've chosen that way? It, it's a conversation you should have with trusted people. That's for sure. What are those things that tempt you? But those things pass away and we all experience that. But anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. So this is the difference. We're, we're getting on this side, the God way, life forever, freedom, goodness, justice, righteousness, all the things that we want to be true about this world. We get it. We're promised it the God way. But man, it doesn't necessarily fit with the way we want it sometimes. And so James, the, whom we believe to be the brother of Jesus, wrote it this way. And James, it's on your paper there. And remember, when you're being tempted, don't say God is tempting me. God's never tempted to do wrong. He himself, he's never tempted to do wrong. He doesn't have to weigh out his options and think, should I, should I not? I, he doesn't. He knows he's not tempted. And he never tempts anyone else. So that's one thing. If you believe what's written here, you can count on that. You can put that to rest and know, okay, if I'm being tempted, it's not God who's tempting me. Temptation comes from our own desires, which entice us and drag us away. These desires give birth to sinful actions. And when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. It gives birth to death. You see how it grows? It's, it's just a tiny little thing at first. It, the desire gives birth. Just I decide, all right, I'm, I'm going to just do this one thing. And then it leads to, oh, snap. I did it. I shouldn't have done that. And some guilt and some... You do it again and you realize I, it wasn't that bad. I don't... I, you know, I got away with it or it felt good in the moment or whatever. You know, I like what I... The results I got out of it. So you do another simple action. And before you know it, you're so far down this track, the temptation after temptation, the choice after choice, we come back and say, every time I get a chance to decide my way or God's way, and so, by the way, up at the top, you may have already figured out. What I'm really asking is, what do you want more? God's way or your way? What do you want more? I'm not naive. I, I have temptations as well. I get it that there are cravings and desires in us that want it our way. I know. And listen, when I work with teenagers, when I talk with you, you are experiencing some temptations I don't understand and I didn't have to experience. And so I'm only trying to come at this from a Bible point of view, not a, I've been there. I know exactly what you're, what you're experiencing. I can't understand every temptation you experience, but I do understand the desire, the drive behind those temptations because those are the same. I want, I want, I want, I want. And so we have got to decide what we want more. And that's all tonight is about is for you to, to challenge your thinking. What am I, what do I want more, my way or God's way? I will tell you, there is some very good news. <laughs> some good news that when we face this, when we face this temptation, that we're not alone. Do you remember when Jesus was tempted, he was alone in the wilderness. He had been baptized and the spirit led him out to the wilderness. And he was alone out in that wilderness for a lot of days. And I don't know on day number what, 
the evil one came and started to tempt him. I don't know what day it was, but I know he did not eat for 40 days and he had, he was alone. And you know how hard that would be. You know how hard quarantine is and you know how hard it is to go a meal without eating. So you're hungry right now. You're like, ah, oh, this is the worst. But Jesus knows what that's like. And after three different temptations, you can read it for yourself if you want. It's in Luke chapter 4 and Matthew 4. And you can read for yourself how Jesus was tempted and how he responded. You guys, Jesus is the man. He is the human the way we're supposed to be human. Every time Jesus faces this decision, every time he's given a choice, he chooses God's way. Every single time. Jesus was tempted in a lot of ways, in all like the ways we are. He was tempted, and yet he did not sin. That's recorded in Scripture in Hebrews. He did not sin. He chose God's way every single time. So, isn't it worthy? Isn't it worth trying to learn how do I become more like that? How do I become more like Jesus? And I'll tell you, it just comes a choice at a time. One decision at a time. Uh, that seems really simplified. Like, if, well, that's, I mean, that's not what it feels like when I'm in the moment. I know. I have temptations too. I won't tell you all my temptations. I certainly am not going to confess all my sins in front of all of you. But there are people who, knows the, who know those things. I've talked with God about those things. But a temptation is when I have an expectation, when I have a way that I think things should be, and it's not met, I can get really upset. I can get really um, frustrated or like have an adult version of a fit. Like I can pout or kind of. So what Ashley has had to experience in the early, early part of our marriage is when I was uh, ticked off, especially while driving. It happened a lot while we were driving that we'd be going on long road trips. I think, Ash, this was before kids. I, I hope that I haven't done this in a long time. I would like she would make a comment about my driving and I'm always right when I'm driving. I know the right way to do it. I'm safe and I'm, I'm defensive. I do all the right things. And she dares correct me. And so what happens while we're driving is the temptation for me then is to either defend myself and correct everything. Like all you don't even know what you're talking about and like convince her or debate with her to make sure she knows I'm right. Or I will intimidate her like, I got this. I'm the driver. You sit over there. I got this. You want to drive? And so I make the person I love the most in this world feel like an idiot or feel so, you know, stupid sitting beside me. Or I'll do something that may be, may be even worse, although I, she may like the silence for a little bit. I would put up this invisible wall and shun and I would just stonewall her. And like the temptation was, if you're going to, you know, if you're going to. Uh, or correct me or do something I don't like, I am going to make you miserable. That's a terrible way to be. It's a terrible way to live. And I can get angry, especially while driving. And I always rationalize, but I'm right. But I know what's right. And in my calmer moments, in my more sane moments, in my more like, Rocky, don't be an idiot. Don't be unwise. Don't be foolish moments. I realize what's really happening is I have to decide in those moments, or I have to decide at some point, am I going to do it my way, which says I'm going to save face, I'm going to um, make them feel worse so I don't feel so bad, I'm going to shun them until I'm ready to talk, any of those ways of doing it, I'm going to do it my way, or I'm going to be willing to, well, what's the God way? Humble myself. Be willing to listen to others. Be willing to admit that I was wrong. Be willing to admit, occasionally I've made a mistake while driving. I'm willing to admit that. The God way is, I depend on someone else to be right anyway. I can't do it all right, all the time. I will tell you, because I try hard, because my parents raised me well, because I love the Lord, I do it right a lot. But guys, come on, you, I don't even have to say, well, I'm not perfect, because you know that. When I come to this choice, I have the decision to make, and so do you. The problem is, it's really, really difficult to do that when you're in the moment. 
When you're in the moment where it's like it's just the pressure is so strong and the temptation is so difficult and temptation comes from multiple ways. It could come from the evil one, like the, this dark, mysterious power, this accuser who's lying to you, you know, whispering in your ear. It could come that way like it did with Eve, like it did with Jesus in the wilderness. But it's not always like this dark, mysterious, evil force. But sometimes it's just like it's my craving on the inside. This is this is what I want. And sometimes it's just, we live in a jacked up world, like on these pictures, what's in the middle. Like it's just, it's not right. All you gotta do is watch the news from this past week to know, oh, there was plenty of temptation going on out there at the Capitol. Plenty of people who think their way is the right way. And they got to this tree and decided, they got this fork in the road, there's not literally a tree. They got to this fork in the road, this decision point and decided like they've got so far down that track, lots of people did. On multiple viewpoints so let me be clear I'm not making a political statement I'm making a statement about temptation and plenty of people felt justified rationalized how they hurt other people mistreated other people broke into places did harmful things because their way is right if you want to beat temptation depend on Jesus he's the only one who ever did it that's what that last blank is on there. Temptation deepens your dependence on Jesus. That's really all I got for you tonight. You might think, really? Not something more helpful? Like, what do I do in the moment of that temptation? Well, that's what the next three weeks are going to be about. How? More like, how do we beat temptation? And it, um, it really, the source, the, the strength to do it is through Christ. And it's, it's, if you can change the way you think about temptation and instead of thinking, oh, I just always fail, I just blow it every time. If I do it my way, I'm just the worst because it leads to death and I feel like I'm dying. And it is not good to go that way. It is, it does eventually lead to death. But you can't fix it just by saying, I'll try again. What you gotta do is depend on the only one who ever picked the God way every single time. And so is your dependence on Jesus Christ. Do you really trust him? Do you believe that he is the only one who lived the perfect life? And not just because he had this superpower and like had this force field. No, no, no. He chose like Adam had, and Eve had a chance to and Abraham and Moses and all the people after them and right up till now, he chose every time the right way and so we can become more like him and 1 Corinthians 10, 13 tells us, it's, all, it's uh, the last verse on there. The temptations in your life are no different than what others experience. If you're going, no one gets me. Well, maybe not the exact circumstances in your life, but the temptations, the approach, the, the struggle of standing there trying to make a decision at that choice. I mean, they're no different from what others experience. And God is faithful. That's good news. God is faithful. When you're standing there, when you're going this way, when you're back here, when you're well before a decision, you're just kind of cruising in life. He is faithful the whole way. Man, praise God for that. The goodness of God. Thank you, Addie, for pointing us to that. And that song, the goodness of God, he is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. When you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure it. So that's what we'll talk about in this series is how do we face those temptations and decide what I want is God's way. All right. How do I do that in, in the moment? Well, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to give you a little teaser, a little sneak peek. You can't wait till the moment of decision, till the pressure is on, till the temptation is on. I don't want to steal too much from the speakers who will speak the next three weeks, but I, I do want to say you cannot wait till that moment I don't want to say it's too late because he'll give you a way out. But man, the wise thing to do would be to ask, God, give me wisdom to know what to do when I face temptation. And then because it's really difficult, would you please give me the courage to do it? Would you please give me the courage to, to do that? Give me the wisdom to want your way more than my way. And your temptation looks different than mine, but it's the same. It's the same stuff. You get ticked off easily. You go to substances easily. You, you're looking at things you shouldn't look at because it gives you a moment of feel good. You, you, just, you just think people are uh, 
all, they're all wrong and I got it right, or you're looking for shortcuts to find, like how are you gonna make sure you get the way you want, so, so you kind of manipulate everything so it's just your way. So when you find yourself down this way, this is the last thing we're gonna end on before we go to a small group. When you find yourself this way, way down my way, and it leads to death, the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ is that even when we're down there, he's faithful. And he will allow you, invite you, welcome you, run to you, to forgive you, to give you a way to come back to him every single time. No, I did it again. Too many times. I did it again. I did it again. Oh, why do I do this thing? Why do I do what I don't want to do? And why do I not do the things I should do? And he is faithful and he will be there for us. I want you to know that you can depend on Jesus and beat temptation. You can go the God way every time. Let him start to change in you your desire. Ask him. Ask him to change the desires in you. As a matter of fact, I'll ask for you. I'm going to ask that right now of, for, of God on behalf of this group. But you got to want it. I can't make that true about my children or you or any, anybody else. It's hard enough for myself. So I'm going to pray a blessing over you. And Jesus even put in his, like, he had a very short Lord's Prayer is what we call it. And in that Lord's Prayer, he prayed, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. He knows this is a big deal, and he wants for you, when you face that choice, to depend on him. Let me pray over you before we go to a small group. Oh, whoa, 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 wait, 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 wait. Before I do that, before I do that, let me say this about the fast, and then I'm going to close out. A fasting down there. In small group, you'll get a chance to talk about it. At Grace Chapel, we're doing this initiative called 21 for 21. This year 2021, man, that's great news. 2021, so for 21 days, starting today, we are fasting. We're inviting people to join us on a fast, on uh, giving up something. It, it could be food. That's the most common fast. But maybe, it, maybe it's not all food. It's just a type of food. Or, you know, I'm doing away with sweets or Cokes or whatever that may be for you. Or maybe a combination of that and uh, doing away with some media. Turning down the media temptation for a little bit. I'm going to not stream any any movies or TV shows during this month. I will not go to any movies during uh, during the next 21 days. And that is something that I want. Like I love doing. That. I just told you I love butter popcorn and movies. That's a hard thing for me. But I'm trying to say to God, look, it's not that movie popcorn is wrong or watching Netflix is wrong. But I want your way enough more. I actually want you to change in me my desire that I, my desire is more for you than those things that aren't even wrong. I just want to, I just want to depend on you more. So I encourage you to decide what that will be and start tonight. If you're like, oh, it's too late tonight, start tomorrow. Let's do this together. Let me pray. God, you are faithful. You are good that you are with us all the way through our journey from before we face temptation to prepare us and get us uh, get us ready, like we're doing in this room. We're not, well, maybe we're being tempted right now, but uh, we're thinking about it. We're, we're meditating on it. So that when we face those moments of decision, the choice is given to us, we can choose your way and you are faithful. You're good. It is, it is absolutely what we desire. We want to the things that you offer. Goodness, righteousness, justice, peace, Meaning in life. We want those things to be confident in our identity as your children. You know full well. Jesus experienced all the kinds of temptations we experienced and did not sin. So you know it's possible, but how hard it is for us. So please, lead us not into temptation. We believe the scripture says you do not tempt, but deliver us from the evil one who is trying to destroy us. Lead us to, uh, to death. And Father, we pray for wisdom. In those moments of decision, uh, of decision, of choice, moments of temptation, wisdom, to know what is the right thing to do, what is the God way, and then that we have the courage to do it. In the power of Jesus' name we pray. Amen.